up a seat to the bar and join us for another episode of McAnally's Pubcast, a podcast exploring the fun and fantastical mind of Jim Butcher's The Dresden Files series. Hosts Tansen, Jess, and Maggie bring you another round of literary analysis on this immense, immersive, and colorful environment inhabited by Harry Dresden, the world's only licensed private investigator and professional wizard. Join an active and engaged community of new and diehard dedicated fans focused on the fabulous themes, theories, characters, context, lore, and more. This is McAnally's Dresden Files podcast, brought to you by Free Flow Rambling. Conjure by it at your own risk. And welcome back. We have returned after our six week hiatus. We are rested, relaxed, and ready for another round of Dresden Files dissection. Thank you to all our listeners for your patience and support. We couldn't do what we do without you. A quick shout out to all of our Patreons. Thank you to Dave, Matt, Mike, SKN, KJ, Samuel, and Zachary. Your support is greatly appreciated. Depending on the tier subscribed to, our Patreons get access to swag, show notes, outtakes, and the Patreon Discord channel where we do live engagements. If you're interested in signing up, go to patreon.com slash freeflowrambling. Another shout out to our Discord members. Your engagement really brings this podcast to life. If you haven't already, come join the conversation. You can find the link to our Discord on our website at macanellies.ca. While you're there, you can also find links to other social media, articles, resources, timelines, links to other Dresden file spaces, and our very own merch store. Well, that's it for now. It is time for our episode. Welcome to the McAnally's Podcast, brought to you by Free Flow Rambling. This is episode 9.1, It Never Rains, It Pours, where we are covering the novel Summer Night. My name is Tanzan, and I'm joined by Maggie. Hello, hello. And Jess. Alpha. Today we have a guest. Welcome, Dave. Hello, hello, hello. So Dave, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, long time geek. Discovered Dresden Files in 2007 when I was unemployed. And my librarian friend handed me, it's like, here, you'll like this. And the rest is history. That's a great librarian you have. Right, I was just going to say. Good taste. Well, we've known each other for eons. Nice. That's about how long librarians live. <laughs> <laughs> Support your local libraries, folks. Any of the good ones. Yes. Mm-hmm. Always. Very cool. So, Dave, since we, we just came off of Grave Peril, is there anything you wanted to talk about about the novel since since we, we just finished it? Grave Peril is one of my least favorite books. <laughs> um, it's tedious. Okay. Oh. You know what? At the beginning of Grave, Grave Peril, I would not have agreed. At this point, no, no. It, it, it. The ending is just too much. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, Tanson will agree with me. We're both over it at this point. <laughs> <laughs> we were, we were ready to finish with Grave Peril about a month ago. <laughs> we just, yeah, we, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, again, great novel sets up a, sets up the entire series, but it takes a lot of legwork to set up the entire series, and it just goes it, on for yeah, a while. Yeah, it does. It's there's. <laughs> almost too much going on. I guess that is fair. It's not something I ever, like, I don't really remember feeling that way in the beginning. I, I don't think I'm really feeling it on this, uh, in my I, Even still, I don't think I really, you know, thought that when I was just reading it, but breaking it down the way we do for this podcast, I think, you know, I can now recognize an author who needed a little bit more who was still in his early days? Well, but, well, Not you know, days, who kind of looked at hasn't refined his craft yet. Who looked at his novels and was like, "Where am I headed with this?" Mm-hmm. And then redid everything from Grave Peril. And he's like, "I actually need to have like a point to this all now. Like, it's not. It can't just be like." random standalone right? episodes like, you know, of Harry's life. It can't just be like every like episode is like a Friends episode. Like, we've got to have like an overarching plot and make the point of this universe worth... You know, that's kind of yeah. how I see Grave Peril was like. And in order to do that, he had to lay the groundwork, which was obviously a lot. And, yeah, no, no. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm a little yeah. bit over it. <laughs> you should have seen us, Dave. The, the, the last recording session we were trying to get through as many uh, se- uh, episodes as, as possible yeah. that day. We just want like, to finish Great Peril. Like, do we want to do a fourth? <laughs> oh. <laughs> How many episodes can we record today just to be done with this fucking book? <laughs> like, we'll be here all day. Let's just be done with this. Uh, well. we're, we're keeping it light today. <laughs> oh, excellent. Ever since his girlfriend left town to deal with her newly acquired taste for blood, Harry Dresden has been down and out in Chicago. He can't pay his rent, 
He's alienating his friends. He can't even recall the last time he took a shower. The only professional wizard in the phone book has become a desperate man. And just when it seems things can't get any worse, in saunters the Winter Queen of Fairy. She has an offer Harry can't refuse if he wants to free himself of the supernatural hold his fairy godmother has over him, and hopefully end his run of bad luck. All he has to do is find out who murdered the Summer Queen's right-hand man the Summer Night and clear the Winter Queen's name. Seems simple enough, but Harry knows better than to get caught in the middle of fairy politics, until he finds out that the fate of the entire world rests on his solving this case. No pressure or anything. No, no, not at all. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> Just another weekend. Now, without getting too spoilery, do um, you guys have any thoughts on on the summer night overall? It was one of my fa- again. I really enjoyed summer night or summer night storm from full moon grave peril, but. Whoa. <laughs> Summer Night was really where, like, it was a really fun one. And again, one of the first, you know, it was the first, like, cause the first couple had already been out. And again, you're, you're in the fairy world. What's not to love? It's a good old standby. Yeah. It's a favorite. Everybody has some lore they love from it. He introduces some great characters and a lot of good shit with Harry going down. Um, so yeah, always has been. It still is, you know, up in my, my top few of I have a couple, you know, standout books throughout the series mm-hmm. now, and Summer Night still holds holds a place there. So, what about you, Dave? Yeah, it's one of my favorites. It's a fun book, and you know the fact that it starts out so unique is what makes it kind of important, and it lays kind of the fairy groundwork that is going to be Harry's life in the future. Yeah, I. Really appreciate this book, too, because this was also um, Jim Butcher's first novel that he had fame before he wrote it. Mm. Because he actually wrote the first three books before they were published. Right. So when he got around to writing this book, he'd actually, you know, sold and and had copies out in the world and was people were talking about it. And you could tell just from, like, you know, he has a bit of an acknowledgement at the beginning of the book. And he's like, um, thank you, world. Like, I I wasn't expecting this reception. And this is crazy and cool. And I'm, you know. Yeah. I think you can also tell you just You like from, me. You really like me. You really like me. But I think, you know, you can almost, you know, see that confidence come through, too, and just the writing. is like, it's mm-hmm. like, okay, yeah. you know what? Yeah. People are willing to read this, and they're invested in what I'm saying. I've got to really make sure that I stick to this lore. And I think, you know, we had we spoke, especially in, like, some um, Stormfront, where maybe Jim Butcher wasn't quite aware of what Harry's spells could do or what his power right. was at. And he maybe did a few spells that have never come up again or haven't for a, a long bit of time, a rough you know? Draft or something, yeah. Right? Yeah, and he's testing the borders in the exactly. first books. So, yeah. And um, I find, yeah, this book is like really helps to cement just like, you know, like, okay, Grave Peril, we really got into it, but Summer Night, we're really like seeing like a man on a roll now, both Harry Dresden and Jim Butcher. Yes. And again, yeah, Summer Night is one of my all time favorites. It's. Yeah, it's right. It took a while for him to come out with another book that became an all time favorite. So for a while, Summer Night was the one I reread okay. more than any others. And I especially like to add in just um, how, I mean, as Dave kind of said, like, yeah, this is the beginning of the end, you know? <laughs> we meet uh, Harry's future in this book, you know? <laughs> it's very. Because we really haven't, like, we got a little info from Toot Toot and Stormfront. We haven't seen fairies, haven't seen really. Fairies. They haven't even been mentioned a whole lot yet. So we're getting kind of a a big, other than, you know, well, I say that. He was dealing with his godmother oh, yeah, last well, book, and he tiptoed into the Went never, to the never, never. But again, yeah, so I guess I can't say they weren't mentioned at all. I will say, other than the never, never, um, this is the first time that we kind of leave Chicago. And yeah. we get to see there is a whole world of supernatural. It's not just in Chicago. Yeah, and he really just, like I say, it was a tiptoe through before, you know, mm-hmm. it was just a shortcut through, and we saw a very small, small section of when they were in there. And even you know, as- they're like, we're running to Bianca's yeah. house, we're going to eat some poison mushrooms, and then we're going to run away again, <laughs> you know? So it was like, yeah, so, yeah, a big, a big look. We've opened the door into the world of fairy and get a lot more background information on them, introduction, mm-hmm. and the world. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank you to our Patreon subscribers for your generous support. It's people like you who help us do what we do. If you're not yet a Patreon subscriber, sign up today and get a fuck ton of bonus content, kick ass merch, behind the scenes outtakes, and more. Sign up today at patreon.com slash free flow rambling. Check. 
Chapter 1. Dresden investigates strange weather patterns with Billy in Lake Meadow Park. While Dresden and Billy talk, an assassination attempt is made on Dresden by humans and a ghoul. <laughs> the start of chapter one made me laugh so hard because I think I misread it the first the first sentence that it it rained toads the day the white council came to town and I think I just subconsciously changed it to it rained tons ah because because then when, <laughs> when the frogs like <laughs> the, 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 the toads actually started falling I was like wait a second that said toads <laughs> I actually have a fun little, and I'm guessing, since you didn't bring it up, you might not remember, but I was there with Tanzan when she literally started this book, and I can't remember if I was reading something. I have a vague recollection. I might have been on my phone. It might have been one of the few times I was playing some kind of... Actually, I feel like it was one of those alchemy things, you know, where you have, like, earth, fire, and water, and you have to start blending everything to make, like, mud and steam, and eventually you... But anyways, regardless of what I was doing, I was doing something else. She was sitting there. And she obviously had just got, you know, she was like, oh, it rained toads. And I sort of automatically went the day the White Council came to town. And she <laughs> kind of gets a nice. fuck look on her face. And the book kind of lowers a bit. And she's like, do you have all of these memorized? <laughs> it's like you do. I'm like, but it's just, it was just a good opening line. <laughs> it is. Like, it rained toads the day the White Council. But yeah, it was, oh my God, it was just one of those perfect moments. It was like so gratifying to me in the moment. <laughs> See, that's really funny, because, like, a guy I was then dating, I gave him, like, the first couple books, and he would, like, start a quote to me, and I wouldn't know how it ended. I'd be like, Mom, how does this quote go? And she'd instantly tell me, but, like, I'd send it back to him. I'm like, yeah, that's my credit now. <laughs> that's where it all started, folks. Long before she had a Discord, she was stealing it from other people. And <laughs> plagiarism. But plagiarism. Works so well. I don't know why teachers ban it. Uh, yeah, I really can't imagine why. Helpful to my academic and professional. So, yeah, so that's, that's always a fun little connection I have to, to summer night now. I <laughs> so totally forgot so about like, that. Yeah, yeah. it's like a little... It's a rather ready. interesting connection. I know, right? <laughs> it was just so cute, but I'm like, I was there the day you read the first line of that book. <laughs> so, yes. So it was not tons. Well, it kind of was. But it was also toads. And it rained tons of toads. <laughs> Eventually it got there. <laughs> Eventually it got there. So it really is kind of a funny little... You know, it's like I squinted around the park for a moment, took a couple of steps onto the grass, and got hit on the head by something damp and squishy. Which right there is just like, and I, you right, you can totally picture the ah, like the the slapping it is. You know? Very comical moment. Very comical that we would all do in an instant. Oh, what is it? Get it off me! Get it off me! But ooh, and uh, yeah. <laughs> so then we are reintroduced. To Billy Borden. Yeah. Billy is no longer overweight and traded muscle for for the uh, the extra pounds that he had. I would like to know where he made those trades. <laughs> um, you can ask Tara West. <laughs> can we? Can. <laughs> so, okay. So, uh, in in the Potter world, we got all of the um, magical beasts and where to find them and Quidditch through the ages. So we're going to get like the Billy Borden's book of muscle bad bound. But, what, bad, no, not bad guys. It's like his exercise workbook <laughs> for how we can all become like super buff and take all that, you know, chubby college weight and turn it into like rippling muscle. <laughs> but, you just uh, have to become a wolf to do it. Oh my god, see, there's always a catch. Right. You know, it doesn't matter what the way. <laughs> Seems like a lot of shaving to me. <laughs> well, actually, no. I guess if you're a wolf, you don't have to shave at all. So it's kind of, I like that we got this little throwback. I was happy to see Billy. Like, we got a chunk of them in Full Moon, but we didn't really get a lot about any of the kids themselves other than sort of who they were and why they were there, right? So it was like, oh, it's like Billy's best. Yeah, so like, it was I kind of brief like intro. Yeah, right? So it was nice that it was like, You've kept in touch. They still know you, or you still know them, or I mean, at this point, we're sort of not quite there yet. But you sort of start getting a, a little bit of a idea that the kids are a little more interested in Dresden than he is. Although I guess I think he kind of says that at the end of Full Moon, doesn't he? That the kids were all like they threw like a Harry's great party or something, and he's like, "Oh man, I've got like a bunch of little like roadies or whatever now, <laughs> groupies, <Right>. groupies, yeah." <laughs> but yeah, but he's he's growing up. It has been a year or two, and uh, yeah, he is maturing and coming into his own more. Billy is talking with Dresden a bit, and he re reveals that the Alphas have been patrolling Chicago 
And um, they, that the reason why they had called him is because of these weird results that have been finding so, sort of supernatural things happening, and Toad's being one of them. <laughs> He's like, this is weird, right? <laughs> Holy vigilantes, Batman. I know, I love that. Uh, the is alphas it? have uh, started to make them make a place for themselves in supernatural Chicago. Y- yeah, they, well, they pulled a little bit of a Harry. Mm-hmm. Like, Harry... Again, Harry was more wizard to start with. You know, he started noticing his powers coming out as a kid, and then somebody picked him up and trained him and was like, Harry, you're a wizard. Um, but, you know, he basically found himself going into this, yeah, I'm going to protect, I, I, I've got powers, I can do something with it. I'm going to kind of keep an eye out on Chicago here. And the where, yeah, Billy and the Alpha, which again, as I love his comment on that. Um, shortly after, too, he's like, God, they sound like a bad rock band. <laughs> 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 Billy and the werewolves. But yeah, basically, that's what they've been doing with their time. They decided, hey, we learned how to be wolves. We can do something. We went and fought the bad guys that one time. Let's make this a regular shtick. And, uh, and yeah, you've got a bunch of kids who are just like, I don't know, we don't know anything. We're just out here in the world. We had Tara. She's gone now. Who do we look to? And yeah, they were like, Harry's the only other guy we actually know on the supernatural scene. And we, we seem to like him. He seemed to be on the good guy's team. So it was very much of that, like, you know, duckling, like, you are my mother yes. now. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. don't have yeah. a mother, and now it is you. <laughs> They've imprinted on him. Totally, right? <laughs> Completely right. Daddy! <laughs> and there's like, I mean, I guess seven to eight years is actually a pretty fairly old age gap when you've got like 18 year olds, you know? At yes. this point, they're maybe like nineteen, twenty, and hair is going to be like, yeah, 27, 28 at this point. So yeah, that's still a significant enough. It's Again. not like they just chose someone like, you know, a yeah. freshman's following a senior, you know? There is a little bit more. And right. I don't know. So Dave, here's an interesting question, because I, for the first few books, I never had a real good age um, on what Harry was supposed to be. Did you have an idea in your head when you started? Like, did you peg him as 25, or did you peg him as like 45? Um... He, I pictured him between 25 and 30, kind of on closer to 25, and he was growing his chops as a wizard, and he was trying to, you know, just get his foot in, out there. Still pretty newbie. Still pretty newbie, yeah. See, this is where I always kind of went back and forth with it, because like I say, Jessica was able, in the intervening years since now, people have put together more of a thing, we've got more of a... But again, one of those things that Butcher never addresses in the book and never really gives you a good... Right? So yeah, he talks about Harry being a young wizard and this and that, right? But I was always, I did a lot of that. I'm like, well, I'm going to assume, because again, for characters like this, you usually get introduced to them around that like 25 to 30 where they're still kind of young and learning and they've got you know you're not going to start at 90 because they'll be dead in two years and there's not much of a series right so you got to have room for them to grow and age and whatever but like you would say sometimes or you were saying or something like that he oh, sometimes sounds like, like, like he a, sounds like he's a curmudgeon 40 year old right it, See, it helps when you start reading the series when you're 12 because curmudgeon old man is 25. Is 25. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had no problem yeah, yeah. pegging him as 25. I was like, yeah, I know, this is an old man. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you're right now with this compare, you know, something that, again, I never thought of strictly in terms of what that age gap was between, you know, like, again, it was like, well, yeah, Harry's already an adult out in the world. He's got his own place. He's got a his own business. Like, he's got an office and all that kind of stuff. And, yeah, these kids are just in their you know, second, third year of university or whatever, but you're right, when you actually stop for a second, you're like, yeah, he's got maybe 10 years on them or something like that. Slightly more, slightly less, kind of the same, a little less probably, yeah, but yeah, and you're like, oh, you're right, because again, right, Harry seems much more established in the world with all of these things, but yeah, he's really just barely ahead of them in terms of being like an adult and knowing what's going on, but he seems so much more worldly. I know, right? Mm -hmm. So... But yeah, I love the holy vigilantes, Batman. (laughs) Dresden asks Billy to help him collect a few toad samples um, for Harry to figure out if they're real or magical constructs. He's really hoping that they're uh, that they're not real because if they're real, that would be bad, right? (laughs) And Billy here again, it's so cute. It's 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 just him and I mean. Partially, again, showing a little bit of how young and what he doesn't know, but also just typical. Like, we haven't come across this before, and Harry apparently, right? And he's like, well, what's this? Why, do, why would that be bad? He's like, well, because, you know, if they're not real, then that's just like a fairy having fun or something. But if they are real, that's a whole other 
well, what about this? Well, what about that? Well, how about? And he's like, fuck, Billy. And I'm like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> I don't know like, if you know, but I've kind of been going through a lot lately, and I don't really like want to be social right now. Okay? Right? Like, exactly. Like, I don't want to play teacher. Just like, and Billy's like, know. well, excuse you. <laughs> excuse me, Mr. Dresden, sir. You're right. Shut up. So Billy d- invites Dresden to come play this game called Arcanos, which is a role-playing game that's in the the Dresden universe. And I, I think this is. I, I thought this one might be just a little nod to his his inspirations for 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 D and D type games. Oh yeah, it's totally. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, oh yeah. But you played a wizard and then <laughs> wrote a book about it. <laughs> <laughs> I've read the Butcher prefers to DM. Oh yeah, I well, I make that he's a storyteller kind that of thing. That makes like, sense just, yeah. because the DM is basically a storyteller. Yeah. Likes to be in charge. Like likes to be in charge. I wonder if he uses his material, like his material and DMing, to like sort of experiment with what what would be good for his novels and his short his yeah. short stories. <laughs> Guinea pig it in some. And like, oh, that went terrible. I'm not using that. Yeah. <laughs> workshop this a little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Workshop it mm-hmm. right. Yeah. Surely people would normally come up with this plan, right? Okay. No. No, they would not. No. Okay. We'll try it. Oh no, they will. Nope. They nope, won't come up with this plan. Nope. Going, <laughs> nope. No matter. What we Throw do. another bone. No, they still don't. Okay. I guess no one would have come to this conclusion. Uh. <laughs> right. So Billy and Dresden keep on talking, and Billy lets on that he has a ton of knowledge about the supernatural. He knows about the vampire wars. He knows about the White Council, and Dresden is just plain dumb. <laughs> like just. Um, huh? What? what? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> what vampire war? You're right. Well, exactly, because he's all like, ooh, we get to play with, like, you know, the fortress and the thing and the vigil. And he's like, sounds too much like work. <laughs> you know, he's like, we've got demons and dragons and everything you interested in. He's like, mm. So, yeah, then he's like, okay, I know. But, yeah, I just love that he's like, what vampire war? Oh, come on. And I even know that the White Council is coming. What White Council? <laughs> Like, it just, I love Dresden's whole response to that. Okay. He's like, okay, look, Harry. <laughs> so, yeah, he's got just, again, this is a little bit of the, the um, just enough to be dangerous kind mm-hmm. of a thing. Billy kind of, he's learned about this stuff, but we also see, you know, in his questioning and things of this conversation that he really doesn't know, like, doesn't know details and he doesn't know the whole big, right? So he's he's getting in there. He's tiptoeing into the waters, yeah. but he's not. The annoying thing about werewolves is that they can hear everything. So even if no one's telling them, they're <laughs> yeah, like, oh, I heard the word White Council. I heard Raining Toads. I heard Vampire is, War. That is true. While they're skulking around yeah. in their furry forms, they could be picking up all kinds of extra tidbits. Cause yeah, they, that's kind of why they don't know any of the details on anything, because they just hear a conversation where, you know, there isn't a talking head needing, you know, like, <laughs> you know, like um, Nick DiRamiro on YouTube. He basically just insults content all day long. So I like to watch him because I like insulting things. That's what this podcast is. But <laughs> even though we all have the Dresden files. Uh, but anyways, he was like, mm, I think he was breaking down like some Disney Plus or no, some Disney original movie. And he was uh, basically pointing out, he's like, it's weird because all the characters tell each other who the girlfriend is, even though obviously you and your best friend would know who your girlfriend is. So there's no need to explain to the main character who the girlfriend is, because the main character knows who the hell the girlfriend is, right? Yes. So it's like a lot of times, like the nice thing about Billy is that he's not running around listening to anyone say who the girlfriend is, because obviously the two characters know who the girlfriend is, so Billy can't be like, wait, who's your girlfriend? All he hears is White Council and Vampire War, and he's like, someone's girlfriend's fucked up. (laughs) 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 Yes, it is, and it's funny how you do that, because I always think about that in movies and stuff, too, where you're like, you need that information, but then you're like, Oh yeah, wait, that is like a really weird like if these two people were just having this conversation, that'd be a totally fucking weird right, way to right. have like or in um in a visual aspect how they always like somebody jumps out or is hiding or something like that. But it's like you're behind the camera, but if you were actually like in that scene, that person totally would have seen you standing behind that doorway because you're on the same side as them or something. Like, you know what I mean? It's like mm. Yeah, I thought that little interaction between the two of them was a great, great way to recap, like the, the last book. Like, yes, really yes. good way of, of just just en- just enough to refresh your memory and not bash you over the head with the, too many details. Yeah. So Billy warns Dresden that the vampires are offering offering vampiric reward to anyone who can bring Dresden down. So it kind of opens up to this, um, the, the daylight is no longer safe for, for Dresden and, and all these assassination attempts that are happening to him are just going to increase now. Well, we, we know for a fact that this whole vampire thing happened in October, right? 
Yes. We're just a few weeks before Harry's birthday. We don't know exactly what we know it was October, right? In the fall, yeah. And we know that it's yep. July now, right? Because yes. Billy says as much. And Billy says, like, you know, the last time we saw each other was January. Like, yes. we went to a football game, right? Dude, like, <laughs> you were becoming full hermit. You're fully breaking off from everyone. Like, you were getting... We're worried about you, which is, you know, it is cute. You know, a bunch of college kids are like, we gotta invite our friend to Harry out. Like, he's like, which is yeah. like, you know, and you've got your, some <laughs> old friend you all look up to. It's like, oh, we gotta, we gotta bring him to game night, guys. Like, this guy's <laughs> sad, right? So it's really just like, it is cute, but it's a lot more telling that, yeah, like, I, I mean, you read um, the um, book summary at the beginning of this episode, right? Mm-hmm. So we, we know, like, Harry's behind on his rent, he's not doing so well, and he's upset about Susan, who you obviously couldn't save, because that's, like, another big whatever. Yeah. And he's, like, he's avoiding everyone. Kinda he's kind of going through an emo phase. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Big time. But yep. deservedly so. Yeah, he's really Robert Patton singing it up in here. <laughs> <laughs> Just his new obsession. <laughs> the Batman. I'll watch it when it's free and I don't have to rent it. So it might be a while before I see it. Oh. And this is, and, and Billy starts calling him on all of it. You know, that's basically what he says. You know, he's like, we know you're all working on something. And, you know, but he basically says, you know, Harry looks like shit. He's like this whole unwashed thing. And Harry's like, you don't know what you're talking about. And he's like, yeah, it has something to do with Susan, right? And Harry's like, Bitch. But kind of thinks he's just dealing with this all on his own. And it's his own problem. But again, people aren't as stupid as you know, either as Harry thinks or Harry just isn't thinking at all about their perception, you know, and they're like, we realize that this is a huge thing and that stuff's going on, but exactly, you can't stop eating, you can't stop sleeping, you can't stop But to the flip side of that, we know that there's assassination attempts on him, so it's not just himself, right? Like, that's another thing that gets brought up is that, yeah, like, he's not just, you know, being a sad guy. Like, people are actually trying to actively kill him during all of this, you know, like... Yes. Yeah, and he lets on that he's got no money anyway. So, mm-hmm. so that's mm-hmm. sort of probably keeping him more. But because he's not taking any working jobs or anything, so it's to the point of that's like you literally can't take care of yourself. Like, you mm-hmm. know, you can't just, it, like, how are you going to help Susan if you're, you know, homeless or you starve to death or you're whatever, right? Yeah, Billy's really showing that he's a real friend. And he's like calling Harry out on his crap. It's like, dude. Completely. And, you know, for like a broke college student himself, he's being pretty mature and reasonable, you know? He's like, um, I'm pretty sure these things are important. Like, I know I'm not quite there yet, but don't you have to, like, pay your rent? Don't you want to keep your office? (laughs) Right. He's like the kind of friend that, you know... It, it's you really really want to have but at the when you're in the moment of shit and despair you really don't want to have at the same mm-hmm. time because they're doing so much for you that that you need that yeah. is good and and but, but you're like it's just yeah damn it, it. i don't want you to do this pain but i need it yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, we haven't uh we haven't been reintroduced to georgina yet but you know you quickly see georgina and belly are just like the mom and dad friends of the group and it's like okay guys just chill <laughs> you're 20 <laughs> <laughs> but yeah Everybody needs that in their group. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, they're all just a bunch of jackasses. So Billy yeah. and the alphas, but Billy, Billy is the alpha. Billy is right. the alpha of the alphas. Um, I uh, love that Billy like, lets Harry know that he set up a, an appointment for him. Like he just went out of his way to, to like checks his messages for him, and then like makes makes arrangements for this this call and like sets an appointment up. Like yeah, <laughs> happened to be in the right place at the right time. And guess what? I said you, you know I took this appointment for, and it's it's because your hair's like I didn't need a babysitter. And then he's like it's none of your business. Like literally, it's my you know. Know, and and uh, it's yeah, you gotta be like Billy. What the heck? Like you're just totally trying to pick up the pieces, make sure his entire life doesn't fall apart because he's dealing too much with his own grief, his own shit, whatever to deal with it, right? And you know, he obviously hasn't been real pushy about it until now, but he's starting to be like, okay, now you're starting to get all the final notices, you know? That's invasion of privacy, though. I would be angry if I was yeah, Harry. At the same it's time. a little far for me, yeah. too. I'm like, I really want to love the gesture, yeah. but it's it's like, if that, if that was me, I'd probably be pretty upset, but at the same time, yeah, I probably needed that kick in the pants. Yeah, yeah like, he's so doing that you recognize me. it, but even, like, coming from, like, even Michael or Murphy, I think it'd be a little bit better, but Billy, it's like, who the fuck are you? <laughs> like, and you're younger than me, you're a child. I've only known shit. you. Yeah, like, I guess at this point, he's actually known Billy in the world for two years, actually. Yeah, it has been a but, couple of years. But still. But at the same time, I'm like, at least it was his office and not his, um... Apartment? Yes, at least, oh, you know, it didn't... 
But yeah, exactly. But yeah, Billy's basically being like, well, yes, because you're not fucking doing a thing. So yes, you know what? Yes, I did go to your house. <laughs> you said something earlier, though, and like, it just made me like, you know, made me think like Billy is the alpha of alphas. And it's like, oh, like when Frodo saw Sam, he's hobbits of hobbits. Just like, oh, you know, oh. like. <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned a while back that I'm doing that. I was going through that 1981 BBC radio play of The Lord of the Rings. And it's really good, guys. If you've got 13 hours to spare, (laughs) it's just... Because you know what? 13 hours, you know, the movies can only be like, what? Six? Seven? Eight? Maybe nine with like full extended inch cuts? No, yeah, aren't they all like three-ish hours? I don't really know. But um, I've fallen asleep through every single (laughs) time I've ever tried to watch the movies. But the radio play is so good. I actually, I really like it. But yeah, when Harry gets all pissed off about this, it's a little bit, we'll see a bit more of this as it goes along too, but Harry's not like totally psycho, but he's a little bit possessive about his things. Like mm-hmm. his house is his house and his car is his car and his office Chicago is his office. Chicago. Chicago is his Chicago. And, you know, and so Things yeah. he has a right to be possessive about. He does, mm-hmm. but I'm like, I, I relate to that a lot because in a lot of ways I'm like a very open person and I like love about all kinds of stuff, but I've been like in roommate situations and things like that and I will get like completely squirrely about something small, you know what I mean? Like, like why did you rearrange my books? Like, I had my books the way I wanted my books. Why the fuck? Really, it's not that big a deal. You haven't, like, gone into my bedroom and rifled through my underwear drawer or something. Although I had some of these at once, and let me tell you, I was upset about that. But that's a different <laughs> that's a different tale for a different time. <laughs> okay. But, you know, but something like, like, really, it's not that big a deal if somebody moves your books. But at the same time, I'm, like, that twitchy, not OCD, but whatever, fuck, you know. And I'm, like, I just, I see that in Harry sometimes, right? Where he gets very particular about like that's that curmudgeon-y part. He I mean, loves his routines. <laughs> yes, there you go. Yes, his mm. comfort things are his comfort things, and I guess maybe that makes sense too. Harry has a lot of chaos in his life, so I guess those few things that are truly his own that he has chosen and he can control, you know, where he lives, what he drives. I guess that makes a certain. Every now and then, he's just really that old man wizard. He just, just embodies it. Really, it must be like a genetic thing or something. Along with like your magical powers, you also get some of those like ingrained personality traits. <laughs> I I know that there's like um, a short story with Murphy uh, where she says she's like, oh, like if you didn't know he was a wizard, you'd think he was autistic. So you'd, like he won't like. Um, look anyone in the eye and he like tries to make himself seem a lot smaller and less intimidating unless he's in the moment and he tries to like you know like he oh, doesn't yeah. want anyone touching his book he goes to the with same his place stuff. to eat same. he's lived in the same place for years he drives, he drives the same car yeah. right like that's and but maybe harry honestly is just both <laughs> maybe he is just <laughs> autistic and a wizard you know <laughs> yeah the, 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 the venn diagram is probably a circle there <laughs> yeah, at least as far as Harry's concerned, yeah. It's a solid, you know. Dresden continues to argue with Billy. Uh, they are interrupted by an assassination attempt. <laughs> Masked men with automatic weapons show up in a pickup truck. <laughs> right. So as we failed to mention this entire episode so far, um, the park has been completely devoid of anyone but a little old lady doing laps around Billy and Harry. Yeah. Which, again, though, I like the writing in this. Because, honestly... Brand new, the first time I ever sat down with this book, I didn't figure much. It just seemed kind of like one of those little, de- you're in the park, and it's, yeah, it's like, it's super hot, so a lot of people aren't out. Also, let's see, it's draining toads, <laughs> so a lot of people aren't here, you know, so this part. But again, there's that, you know, little old crazy bag lady or whatever that's wandering around with her rattly shop. You're like, where else is she going to go? What else is she going to do? Of course, she's not going to worry about the rain and toes. She's still going to go and, you know, and it just feels more like it's setting the scene without being anything more than what it is. I'm that like, surprises me. Because, because you tricky little devil. Well, it surprises me that you didn't pick up on that because you are the person to ruin books and TV shows and movies for everyone else because you figure out the plot in the first 20 minutes and then the rest of us are just trying to enjoy content. You're like, everyone knew that was going to happen. <laughs> this is Obviously true. <laughs> And my fiance will complain about that all the time. He tells me to shut up and fuck yeah. him all the time. He's like, you saw this already. I'm like, no, I just... It's really funny. Why else would he... they cast a crazy bag lady in the park? If she wasn't exactly. so surprising me that it's you would read yeah, this and but not... I don't... Think... Books we were are younger different. Back then. Books Stupider. are more... Visual medium is different because you can see what's going on. So if you see a bad guy with a big mustache and a black cloak sneaking around in the background... 
But books can't do that. They have to tell you. You're going to know that's there. They have to describe everything. So they get more, right? There's They do have to describe the non-important stuff because, again, you can't just see that they walked into a room with a clock. They have to tell you they walked in. So is the clock important or are they just telling you that that's the room they walked into? And that's, I think, why sometimes with books, why stuff like this sometimes is like... See, my bigger issue with it is that I just have less trust in authors and editors because, typically speaking, you've got one author and one editor. And that's the only peer review it gets, whereas if you've got a TV show or a movie, you've got like five or six writers, and you've got the director, and you've got producers, and you've got the cast, and you've got the crew, and you've got the makeup mm -hmm. art, and like there's just a lot more people to be like, this doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Or, why would we make a costume <laughs> that's not relevant to the plot? You would like, think that would happen more often than not. <laughs> you, you, know, you know, but I still tend to have more trust when I see a movie, because at that point I'm like, well, they wouldn't spend $80 oh. billion dollars to CGI this if they don't need it, right? See, <laughs> Whereas, I'm almost a little bit the opposite, where I'm like, eh, nobody cares about that, they just think it looks cool, and they put it in, and nobody stopped to research, whether, whereas like, authors have to like research everything to make sure they're... Yeah, interesting <laughs> takes on it. I don't know, but yes. Dave, did <laughs> Any, you pick up on the bag lady? <laughs> anything to throw in, Dave? I, I didn't really expect her to uh, turn out like she did. She was just kind of like, you know, wallpaper. Right, she seemed like just adequate background scenery. Like, it was just a small detail that was yeah. just like a throwaway kind of. You know, it's just him and Billy hanging out in the park with the crazy old bag lady. As you do. As you do. Right. And then, yes. Dresden utilizes his, uh, his shield spell with his bracelet and deflects oncoming gun gunfire. Mm -hmm. All sorts of craziness happens. He, he, he uses his ring as well and starts using kinetic men and magical energy to knock knock people to knock their asses. people out. But he, yeah, he says specifically how he can't aim it like right at him because I'd probably yeah. kill him. And right. it's it's a really nice touch off to this scene too. Again, the things that I live for and, and I really love about these books, where he's busy. Um, um, dressing down Billy and giving him the what for. It's none of your business. I don't need this. I haven't dropped the ball and I don't need you. Naturally, the hit went down right then. <laughs> you know? It's like, yep. Yeah. He's like, get back, get behind me. I'm going to save you right now. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, right? So, yeah, basically, they, because I think these a couple of guys, they're in the back of the, like, they're in the bed of the pickup, right? Like, shooting at him over top of the cab or something, are they? So, yeah, somebody drives up and, and so he's got the whole. Which is cool. I like because we, we, his shield bracelet is one of those fantastic little, like it is one of his good go-tos. We do get to see it a lot. It's very handy. It's very handy. And he does a good job with it. And it's one of those things where it's interesting, you know, where you'll see as the series goes along, the occasional tweak he makes to incorporate things that, you know, it maybe was not originally intended for, or things he hadn't thought or, you know, didn't expect to. <laughs> but thankfully, it's pretty bulletproof right off the start. So even though these guys have, like, submachine guns... Well, I like, too, that for some of these magical items, rather than, like, Butcher being like, Oh, like, I didn't make that strong enough for what I need, or I made it too OP, or I made it this. Like, he just has Harry, you know, lose it or break it or reforge it. But Harry himself is getting smarter, and he's like, I used a better material this time, because, like, now I understand that, like, a ghoul can easily, like, break that off my wrist <laughs> or whatever, yeah, you know? Right, like, exactly. Because I like that he's able to, like, level up Harry's tools as well, with just Harry being a smarter guy, being like, I... Had to yeah. forge my own shit, and so I made it better this time. Right. <laughs> and then Butcher exactly. gets to be like, we've got a slightly, instead of a plus one, we now have a plus two <laughs> shield bracelet. <laughs> yes. So during this fight, Dresden gets his uh, spidey senses. <laughs> I love yeah. that moment. And notices the old lady that he'd seen before. She begins to attack Dresden from behind with a sawed-off shotgun. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. This little lady and then rips it <laughs> turns out to be a young woman that's in an old age makeup. And yeah. can I tell you, I just howled. That was so funny to me to imagine this woman. Granny suddenly. <laughs> It, the, the preparation point, though, like, oh. I'm going to kill Dresden. How am I going to kill Dresden? I know. I'm going to dress up like an old lady. And I'm going to spend five or six hours in a makeup chair making myself <laughs> look like an old lady. Jen said on TikTok, makeup tutorial, how to kill a wizard. <laughs> And, and and finding out what she actually is makes it even more funny. I like I had so many levels of yes, laughter about this. That's true because she's already disguised just as a woman. Let alone the you know how long girl. it took Bianca to get into a fire dress just to insult Harry. And like, <laughs> all of these bad guys are just like, okay, I'm gonna have the most perfectly coiffed beard I before I kill Harry. Beard. I don't know. Her hair. Can you quaff a beard? Know. Uh, Seneca I can. Don't Okay. I was thinking, you know, there are some Seneca pretty beards from out Hunger there. Games. Well, I'd I say suppose yes. now there is a lot. Of, I guess you could 
Beard cloth. art is a thing, okay? Beard art, but I just don't know if I, yeah, okay. okay. Point is, though, is that a lot of bad guys spend a lot of time looking good to kill Harry. <laughs> and yes, it is funny to think that they spent like six hours applying prosthetics just to do it. <laughs> just to do it. But his hands, because you know, this is the hands are still, right? So it didn't bother with, the right? Hands, did yeah. the whole full. The other thing, see, this is another one of those points like you're just making about how it doesn't quite fit together, because then you're like, well, wait a second. Like, this is great, but it seems semi-random. Like, Billy has called Harry to the park. So, the guys on the pickup truck, I don't know, maybe they just kind of been following him around. That's what I would think, because they're just following him around. She's, in like you say, probably, you know, at least a good couple hours or something to get into a bag lady, if not five or six hours, if she's really done full, like it... like she's clearly well researched on what he's doing. How the hell does she know? Does she have he's a wiretap in his that phone? Like... Well, exactly, right? She had a bug on the beetle. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the bug, the beetle. Like, but none of that would work because Harry would blow it out. So I'm just like, this is just. I, I mean, I guess he did arrange to meet Billy. So obviously, this is something prearranged. Somebody could have heard about it at some point, and you know, if Billy called him the day before or something, they got right on it. But it's just one of those things that it's like, wait, she's already there. She's already, really, you know what I mean? It's just this is a lot of setup for something that seems like a sort of random in the moment. Like, it's not outside his office. It's not outside his house. It's not outside. Well, that's the as- thing about crazy bag ladies. They can get you anywhere. They're not just in the park. <laughs> you just gotta know where. But I'm just saying, how does she know to be a crazy bag lady at the park today? Like that's Well, just- again, like, as, as Harry, you know, quickly yells, he's like, they're sending kids after me. Like, they don't, they're not doing a whole lot of training. These aren't, like, seasoned professionals. The bad guys went out and basically just paid off a bunch of kids to be like, hey, listen, no, I guess see this guy around the city, get him. Well, I guess, but that's what I'm saying is for these guys, it could be more of a, hey, wait, is that him? For her to have prepared and been in place had to have been a whole premeditated plan thing, not just an, oops, I... I doubt she's wandering around the cities in old lady. Uh, all we day. do find out that she is a supernatural creature. That she's a ghoul, that and is. you know ghouls have heightened senses. So maybe she was, you know, can smell his trail or something. <laughs> We've know. dealt with ghouls before, right? Yeah. We- I still like it. Billy does the whole uh, Harry. Not now, not now. Uh, but Harry, I really think I'm a little busy right now. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. They get attacked from behind. Mm-hmm. Dresden's unable to defend himself from the woman with the shotgun. And Billy changes form and attacks the woman, which is good for... <laughs> Here, I'm going to save you. No, I'm going to save you. Like a Billy the Naked turned into it's- Billy the Wolf. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Mutual life save. It's, it's exactly. very simpatico here, you know? But that's really the whole point of it, is that it's, like, it's not just Harry I trying to protect the world. You. The werewolves can hold their own, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. There are more teammates. The wolves are not to be trifled with. Mm-hmm. Big. Tara West did her goddamn work. She did, and they have obviously, cont- right, not just, like, as we were saying in the beginning here, you know, not just like, oh, cool, we can be, but they've obviously been putting a lot, like, work and effort and as, organizing As I said, themselves. Billy lost a lot of weight. That wasn't just, you know. Yeah, he's, they've been training. They've been training they've and doing. They've organized themselves into patrolling, and, yeah, it's becoming, like, it's not just completely random chaos for them either so he manages to get the drop on her before she can shoot because harry's like yeah well i kind of this guy's like reloading his machine gun i can't exactly take my shield away from this and but you gotta admit it was decent planning on their part right like the attack from both sides kind of a thing because that is a lot harder to defend. you say he's got his shield up against these guys it's really easy to shoot him in the back so and if they didn't know billy was a werewolf because I was going to say, I was like, if I, I would have waited until they departed ways, but if they think Billy's just some random guy. Well, yes, there's that too, which is very... Yeah, sucks right. So for they you. have the element of surprise on their attackers, which is good. Yeah. Dresden manages to grab the shotgun after um, the woman drops it. Yeah. <laughs> after Billy, like, chomps down on her arm and we yeah, like, and, and we learn that, that, <laughs> that the woman is not human, that she is, you know, got She claws starts changing, yeah. As a ghoul. And she gets a hit in on poor Billy. Yeah. But he, but he grabs the shotgun and shoots the woman in the stomach. <laughs> Which only does so much. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, what more like, do you have to do? Falls over and then's like, oh. Sawed off shotgun to the gut. And what does she do? What does she do? Yeah. Although it, I think it was enough to, it was enough deterrence that mm-hmm. she like books it into the truck and they all take off. So yeah. It's like, oh, this is way too much. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, he was just supposed to drop. Wait, he's fighting back? <laughs> Fucking fucker. <laughs> 
hate when that happens. <laughs> Ruined my whole old lady thing. <laughs> now I gotta find something new. <laughs> so it's funny, like, not only was she sitting in this chair preparing herself for several hours, this is a ghoul that's been sitting. It's like, right? Well, <laughs> and, and even funnier, that if, like, as we know, ghouls make, like, they have a flesh mask, right? Yeah. So maybe they're not allowed to change their flesh mask, but I'm like, why wouldn't you just make a flesh mask an old woman, though? Why did you make yourself a young woman and then apply the old woman if you could have just been the old woman to begin with? But maybe they can't. Maybe yes, they can't change it. Maybe they can only be. I don't know enough, and thus far, I don't think it's been addressed anywhere. I don't know how a ghoul is... Like, again, right, like, vampires and werewolves are people that have become infected with a demon or a this or a curse or whatever, right? Ghouls, no, we don't have like, ghouls, ghouls come from, right? So, like, yeah, it's like, where does their... Because same thing with the vampires, although we do learn more about that later, but this, I know, is something I brought up in the first book of, like, does Bianca look like Bianca because that's the person she was before she was turned, or can Bianca make herself look like Bianca, or can she make herself look like an old lady, or you know what I mean? It was like, how much flexibility, mm-hmm. and we, we do learn some more of that later on, but I don't know about ghouls, right? Like mm-hmm. like you say, right? I'm like... Maybe when Harry starts to war with them, we'll figure it out. Maybe. Can you get on that, Harry? we got questions. <laughs> so there's another point that made me laugh really hard, too. I, and, and I don't even think these moments were really intentional, but just how they came out just made, mm-hmm. just tickled It's kind me. of the bonus, right? The- like, Dresden, as they, they, they leave, Dresden realizes he's still got this toad in hand. Oh, and yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very yes, funny. I think this- imagining this, this really, like, this toad with its eyes bulging out being squished. Like, oh, I was going to yeah. say, like, you squished it to death during this fight. Like, <laughs> almost. Almost. <laughs> <It's> so- <laughs> Yeah, and I think, no, I think that's very, again, I think this is just Butcher's, like, nice little tongue in cheek. And tongue in cheek is that. Yeah, by the way, remember that toad he picked up? Oh, yeah, it's still there. <laughs> <laughs> very consistent with his, his writing there. Yes, but yes, Love that it. is a very, very fun. And he's like, yeah, suddenly realize. And he's like, hey, well, we can just let him go. And he's, oh, yeah, that was it, because Billy's all like, is it dead? And he's like, sadly, no, those things are tougher to kill than... So the ghouls probably, but yeah, he's just like starts dumping them out, and Billy's like, "What the hell? I thought you needed those." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, we've determined it's real by toad turd. <laughs> <laughs> turd by toad. I hate it when that happens. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> so then he's like, "Okay." So then Billy's like, "So that means things are bad then, because you said if they were real ones." So yeah. So now, aside from this, you know, we'll just go back to our normal conversation because life carries on. <laughs> So now they find out that the, the, the natural world is out of whack, out of balance. And I mean, I know, like, Billy says, too, because he said something like, I don't know if this was in the beginning or now, where he's like, uh, there was, like, tornadoes in Louisiana, and they're thinking they were picked up and dropped off. And I kind of like Harry's line. He's like, I love how that's a more reasonable explanation than, like, it's magic. You know, it's like, oh, well, there was, like, a tornado or a hurricane or whatever down in, like, Louisiana, and it picked up a bunch of these swamp frogs, and now it's blown it all the way over to Chicago, and now they're all falling out. And he's like, wouldn't magic just really, at this point, be an easier, more logical explanation? <laughs> yeah, but real world doesn't want to deal with that. Yes, no, I know, but I just, I, I like, that's his whole point, is that we're so desperate for, like, reasoning and logic that that is what, you know? It's like, well... Well, at that point, I'd almost think it's just it's just magical. <laughs> God, just rain down toads on us. So the two end up uh, entering the beetle, and Dresden apologizes, well, kind of apologizes. <laughs> he admits that he can definitely be an ass. <sighs> I'm an ass sometimes. And he, yes. he, d- he agrees to do the job and, and clean himself up, because... Yeah, because Billy's like, yes, like so this right. appointment I made you, you're going, right? Yeah. And he's like, fuck. Just as they're about to leave, Dresden is overwhelmed by this sort of chaotic magical force that, uh, and, and a deluge of to- toads come oh, in like hail. These poor guys. Right? It was no little Just soft laundry shoot drop for these Can't guys. say that no animals were harmed oh. in this. Uh, oh, in the making month. of it, right? <laughs> well, and <laughs> another point about it, too, is like, this is when Harry should be able to really refuse, because like... Now I'd be like, w- w- appointment at three, uh, look at the sky, and the White Council is coming. Like, I actually... I'm all busy today. <laughs> any other day of the week, if you asked me, I'd have been free. But today I actually do have shit to do. Like, this would have been the time, but Harry being Harry. Harry being Pick him another job and watch, yeah, Never toads die. His little pseudo-buddy protege, hanger on or whatever you want to call him, has just helped save his life. So it's like, how do you say no? Mm. Fair <laughs> enough. You got clawed in the face by a ghoul for me. Mm-hmm. You snooped through my mail for me. I guess I'll go. <laughs> and right at the end here, Harry finally confirms what Billy said earlier. The White Council is coming to talk about the war. Yeah. So that is... 
just honestly for me, just like a huge like, because the last time we saw them, they were coming to execute him. He sort of slept through all that in recovery after Stormfront, so he didn't have to. But yeah, we just got the hint of it. Yeah, Morgan seemed a little salty about that. <laughs> yeah, but now it's like we get to meet this White Council that we've heard about for like three books. That's all big and scary entity, and realize that has, Dresden has a lot on its plate right now. A lot on its plate, and yeah, that they've had it out for Dresden this whole time too. So it's like, oh, we get to meet your nemesis. Awesome. Well, the the review on the front of this book is literally, you know, starts with a bang and doesn't let up. And yeah, like, I mean, as much as we say every book, the stakes are just higher and higher and higher. But yeah, Summer Night is a really like, boom, bam, baby. <laughs> Before, do you have any other sort of wrapping up now that we've sort of introduced Summer Night or anything you're looking forward to? Well, this is more uh, related to fairies slash the she, just folklore knowledge. You have two courts, the Seely. And the unsealing. Indeed. Both are dangerous. Yes. One is not so malevolent as the other one, but you still don't want to trust them. That's one of the things, you know, if Harry was just thinking a little bit sooner, the name Somerset in and of itself. You've got an appointment with Miss Somerset. Yeah, that should set off bells. Like, yeah. that's just already, like... Oh. Which is why Butcher had to throw a too, rain of yeah. toads and a couple, like, a combined assassination attempt because, you know, just so he doesn't have a chance to think too much yep. about it. <laughs> oh, wait, that really obvious clue would have been really obvious to me on a normal quiet day. I hate when so, you're covered in toad guts. I hate when you're... Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Well, yeah. thankfully, actually, he escapes most of that because it's once they get in the car so really it's just the car is now covered in toad ugh ugh oh, so good. okay this concludes our episode 9.1 it never rains it pours thank you for listening and thank you Dave for being a guest thank you yes thanks thank Dave you so much you can find us online at freeflowrambling.com and macanellies.ca there we have links to our other podcasts social media and other fun tidbits Please subscribe if you like what you're hearing, and please consider supporting us through Patreon to keep the magic alive and to see more content. We are Free Flow Rambling. Conjure by it at your own risk. <laughs>